Today's session in National Science Week is to explore how I'm going about getting Mars ready. Good morning, Lynn, how are you? And so the last few days we're exploring, well yesterday was a bit of background on the Mars One mission itself, explaining why they exist and what they're doing today, their status, as well as day one, which was a couple of days ago now, today's Wednesday, and so on Monday I did biohacking sleep. Well, only a tiny bit of it really, there's a heck of a lot more we could have talked about, but when you've only got half an hour, you've only got half an hour. So today we have half an hour, potentially, to explore how I'm going about getting Mars ready. But before I get started on that, I want to respond to a question I had from yesterday that uh, we didn't have time to cover during the talk. And that was um, from someone that wanted to know, for people who aren't successful in the Mars One selection process, those candidates, would they still have roles with Mars One and would they be part of a team that could potentially be supporting those who end up going to Mars? Which I think is a fantastic question. I mean. You think about it, the people who are Mars One candidates today, the hundred of us who are left, we've been a part of this mission together for a number of years now. We know each other really well. There's only been, <laughs> there's obviously only 99 other people other than me in the world who know what it's like to go through all of this. So we understand what each other's been through. We also have been decided to be good enough by the selection committee to have gotten this far. So there's something about all of us that's good enough to potentially be trained to go to Mars. So this is a unique group of people. What if I don't get selected? Do I have the chance to potentially be a part of a crew that could be supporting the crews that get to go to Mars? And that's something that I'm aware that Mars One has been considering. Um, how many people will go in the end? Hello, hello, Louise. Um, so a question actually that might add to that. So to explain, in the Mars One concept, they're looking to send crews of four astronauts every two years from 2031 onwards. So that timeline may slip out, depending upon, as we talked about yesterday, some of the elements of, um, of how the technical missions are going and any delays. However, if um, that goes ahead as planned from 2032, because it takes seven months to get to Mars, there'll be ideally four people on Mars and then two years later another four, two years later after that another four etc and that will be an ongoing thing. So you'd see quite a few over time, um, only four for the first mission, so yes only four people for the first mission in 2031. So out of the hundred who uh, are in the shortlist at the moment, the next selection process will trim us down to 12 to 24 people who will be put into crews of four to commence 10 years of training to get ready to go to Mars. So 2031, that's quite some time away, but you can imagine how much training is going to be needed to go to Mars, a lot. As I mentioned yesterday, there's nothing on Mars. We needed to, we'll be trained on absolutely everything you need to survive in a remote community. We need to have people who understand how to fix the plumbing, how to do the IT, grow food, you name it, absolutely everything. So that's really important part of this will be the, the long training program, uh, which is what I'm going to be touching on a bit today. Now Mars One have shared a little bit of information about what they're planning to do with their training program. And that is they'll be focused in a similar way on the same sort of program that NASA have, which doesn't surprise me. I mean, the head of Mars One Selection Committee, who's the Chief Medical Officer, Dr Norbert Kraft, has worked for NASA for, for quite some time and has also worked with the European Space Agency, Russian Space Agency, and I believe the Japanese Space Agency as well. So he's got a pretty good idea of what it takes to get astronauts ready to go to Mars. Uh, and so their concepts are aligned on three particular platforms. The first is the individual, get the individual ready. The second is the team. And the third is the technical aspect of things. So from, I'll work backwards with that. So the technical, obviously, as I mentioned before, will need to be trained on a lot of technical information, not just can I fix a broken arm, but can I fly a spaceship? Not a lot of experience with that. So we'll be having to learn a lot of technical information. And I've been undertaking quite a bit of extra technical training myself to think, well, this is new information for me. I need to read up a little bit more about this. Um, I don't have to, I guess. I choose to. I choose to 
start to prepare for something even if I'm not necessarily going to be doing that thing. That's a bit of a mindset place, I think, as well. So if we think about that, why would I bother preparing myself for something that I don't know I'm going to be doing? If I am lucky enough to be selected, it means I've already head start on things, so that makes life a lot easier for me and, and ensures, though, as well, that I'm a better person for the crew that I might be chosen into, that I'm going to be able to contribute as much as possible to the organisation, my crew, Mars One's outcomes. So that's part of uh, why I'm doing that. And it's fascinating anyway. Who wouldn't want to learn how to do some of this? Uh, for example, understanding that the first few crews are going to be involved with completing some of the early construction work, I went and learned how to weld. Didn't know how to weld, so I thought, huh, ah, might need to learn how to do that sort of stuff because some of the the elements of the, the early crews in the construction of the community, the physical infrastructure, will be finishing some of the fine work that the rovers can't do because a lot of the infrastructure is going to be robotically deployed by rovers. But some of the stuff is very difficult for the rovers to do. So some of the fine work that will require maybe some welding, for example, of, um, say, the corridors between landing modules that we'll be living in. So I went and learned how to weld, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Who would want to learn how to do that uh, in a situation that is non-threatening and that is not life critical? Let's have a play. And so I, I sort of taken a sense of play about it all. And why doesn't um, why don't we take that in our, our life, in our work, and our organisations? Uh, a bit of a freedom to play with new ideas and new ways of doing things. So so that's what I that I've been doing with the technical stuff, playing with new ideas and and not being not being worried about getting it wrong. And in fact, when I was learning how to weld, I purposely was trying to get it wrong. I was, I was very purposely trying to, not, I wasn't breaking the machinery or the equipment, but I was, when I heard from the instructor that uh, about, you know, if you do this particular thing, you know, bad things will happen, that particular thing will happen. And so it's going to be difficult to, to deal with. Like, huh, well, I, I better do that thing because I want to know what it, it's going to look like and what it feels like when something goes wrong. Isn't that interesting? We often try and avoid things going wrong, don't we? So if we avoid going, if we avoid things going wrong, then we're only used to the feeling of things going right. And that could be quite a deal breaker then when something actually goes wrong. With you know, the, the deer in the spotlight, who's going to be able to respond to it if we don't ever experience something going wrong? It just kind of reminds me about the, um, the story of the trees in Biosphere 2, and this is about stress. So the, the concept is that if, if we, I guess, expose ourselves to a degree of stress in some capacity, then we're going to be more resilient in the long run. And resilience is, as I mentioned yesterday, one of the selection qualities for <laughs> Mars 1 astronauts. But isn't it helpful in life, <laughs> generally? So, so the story with Biosphere 2... Okay, so um, I like to digress a little bit here. Oh, that's great. See that comment there, rely and encourage our schools to teach how to do it wrong. That's good. And, and yes, we should. But also I think, you know, a lot of parents and, um, and those who support the ongoing edu life education of our, of our youth should also be allowing the freedom for, for kids to get some stuff wrong and, and be forgiving about how, um, how they learn. I mean, these days it's a little hard for, for parents to do that sometimes when they don't have the same sort of time or support in communities, I think. I was reading an article yesterday that was exploring exactly that. Um, where, are the, where are the nurturing elements of our community these days that, that help our youth learn that this is the right way to do things or the wrong way to do things, um, but in a way that's quite forgiving and uh, with open arms to embrace when we get things wrong. Anyway, back to the story. So, Biosphere 2 and trees. Biosphere 2, who aren't, uh, for those who aren't aware, was an isolation program that was developed to see can we live in a completely closed loop environment here on this planet that is able to provide all of the oxygen, water, food, everything to survive in an organic, normally grown situation. So a number of people, I think it was uh, eight of them, were locked away in uh, this biosphere in the desert in the US. Um, this is back in the 90s, I think, 80s and 90s to see could they survive just with this situation. And what they learned, one of the many things that they learned, other than they had, <laughs> they had issues with oxygen, uh, was that um, 
trees need wind to grow strong. Uh, and what they discovered was without the wind, because of course the biosphere was completely enclosed, so there was no wind that was moving through the environment, trees would grow very quickly, so they shot up fast, but would collapse equally as quickly. They discovered that wind was necessary to create a different type of wood or a density to the wood that allowed the trees to develop with a greater strength. So thus, trees need stress to become stronger and to grow more resilient. There you go. Um, so digression, but uh, an interesting story and also part of my journey. So part of my training, my resilience personally, has been around how can I develop my stress like the trees do? How can I become more resilient no matter where I am or what I'm doing? And a few of you may be aware that over the years, the last few years since I've been a part of the Mars One selection process, I've been what I call intentionally homeless. So I decided to not have a home. Um, I decided to really challenge myself to see, can I constantly be on the move? Can I live without the same roof over my head, without security of job or environment and still be happy, still be able to be effective with my work, um, have great health and, and good exercise protocols and the like. So I've been house sitting for the last gosh almost five years until about Christmas this this year um, just gone so actually and how lucky was that hey there I was for the first time in about five years I signed six years I signed a lease for a short-term lease for an apartment and then we were struck with COVID uh, and uh, have lockdown because imagine imagine if I hadn't done that I really would be homeless at this stage so <laughs> fate perhaps uh, anyway, so yeah, so I've been doing that uh, intentionally homeless for, for quite a few years to become as resilient as possible because I know that astronauts during their training program at NASA are constantly on the move. They're often spending months in Florida, for example, or maybe they're, it's time to learn how to fly the Soyuz capsule. So they'll spend months and months and months in, in Russia and, and where they'll learn that. So I thought, well, it, what's that like and how would I deal with that sort of thing? So I exposed myself to that to see how it would work and I can tell you now it was really tough to start with, really tough because we know from psychological research some of the most stressful things that we could put ourselves through as human beings is to move house, yeah right? Anyone here who's uh, moved house before put up your hand, uh, um, how anxious do you get during that period, how difficult is it, even just removing things out of your life, what are you going to take, what are you not going to take, dealing with the removalists, um, getting your energy sorted. It's extremely stressful time. So um, anyway, so I did that permanently, regularly for a number of years and uh, and now moving house, piece of cake. <laughs> no, no, easiest thing on earth. So so that was uh, some of the stuff I've been doing for my personal training and, that's, and Mars One's personal training is about the psychology for the individual. Uh, and that's what some of the training program that they will put us through will be around developing our personal resilience. Uh, and I've also been working with the psychologists and counsellors over the years to do that too, to develop my own personal toolkit for resilience. That's just a short example of a few things I'm doing there. Um, some of the other elements, I've talked about the technical, and the other is team. Uh, so Mars One, their training program, uh, part of it will be putting the teams of four that I mentioned before in isolation during the year and spend a number of months together to put into practice some of the stuff that we might have learned as a group or individuals during the year and practice that as a team in a, in a simulated Mars environment. And uh, I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. How would you do that sort of stuff and can we do that here now? So. So naturally, I thought I'd jump the gun a little bit and I've, uh, I've been doing that already. In fact, last year in October uh, and November, I spent a couple of weeks in the Mars Society's Mars Desert Research Station where I spent a couple of weeks in isolation with other people and we did a whole lot of different research projects as if we were on Mars. We had no uh, internet access. Uh, we couldn't go outside unless it was in a spacesuit and only for about an hour or two um, every few days. Ha, huh, fellow Victorians, does this not sound like stage four of our lockdown at the moment with curfew? <laughs> so I went through curfew for a little while last year, so this is curfew schmurfew. Um, anyway, but it was really interesting because 
we were eating the same sort of food we would eat in a space environment, so mostly freeze-dried or dehydrated foods, uh, and we had extreme limitations for energy uh, and water, uh, and so stimulated being in that sort of environment and trying to achieve something together as a team in that in that period. And so that was a great training exercise for me, and I did some food waste research on that. And I've um, published an article in The Guardian, uh, what's the Guardian of the Conversation, uh, earlier this year that shared some of the things I learned, so that was pretty cool. Um, so there was a question just there about uh, the plan to leave in the first place for Mars before COVID. So the question, uh, I'll just respond in regards to time. The time period that Mars One's schedule was was for 2031 for the first mission human mission, but there'll be about eight technical missions in advance of that that will send infrastructure rovers to deploy the infrastructure and uh, and things of that sort of nature. So good chance that some things might get shifted out in the current environment, uh, as we discussed yesterday. And uh, we'll hear about that from Mars One when they make formal announcements. Okay, so the next question uh, around some of the training, how I'm getting Mars ready. So I've talked a little bit about very small amount on um, some of the technical training, a little bit on some of the personal psychological stuff and a little bit on team training. And I've been doing a lot more around that, um, but in this short time there's only going to be so much we can cover. But I was asked by somebody um, uh, earlier this morning to talk about a couple of different things that I think uh, are worth exploring. And one of them is around um, how I stay motivated. So if you think about it, if I'm not potentially going to Mars for at least 10 years, if I even get chosen in the first crew, and if I even get chosen to be part of the crews that get trained, uh, or even if Mars One um, is you know, viable for the entire period of time, so what if they fall over in a hole in the next week? So how do I stay motivated for such a long-term goal with so much uncertainty? Uh, and that's a, Which is an interesting thing to think about. I guess my PhD is a good example of that. It's like, well, if, it's in, if I make it important to me, it's easier to stay focused. So my PhD adds purpose to my life, and the outcome of that is not just about I've developed this great sense of knowledge. It's about what I can do with that knowledge and what function does that have beyond just me and self-actualization at this moment in time and doing something interesting. So I take the same approach for the Mars One process. Um, even though I don't know what the end goal will be, uh, I just make sure that what I'm doing today has a function for the future but is fascinating today as well. Will this outcome benefit me today and in the future regardless of Mars One or not? And, and some of it is because it's just purely interesting and fun, and others because it has extremely important function. For example, and I don't have time to go into it today, but I might touch on it. Uh, I'm thinking about doing something in a few weeks' time on bone mass. Uh, but uh, some of you know that I've been doing, doing a lot of work in increasing my bone mass, which is something that astronauts lose in space. So here's some of my own personal training for Mars. Uh, how am I getting Mars ready? I'm actually trying to put bone in the bank today so that I can afford to lose it if I go to space. Because astronauts lose about 20% of their bone mass in um, a few months in space, in about six months. So that's a lot. And that's what women lose going through menopause over about mm, nearly a decade. <laughs> and uh, the astute of you watching this will know, I'm a woman. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm already going through menopause. So there's a good chance I'm gonna be losing that much already. So add the two together and that's a bit of a risk. So I decided, well, if I can work on increasing my bone mass, sure, that would mean I'm going to be able to deal with that potential loss if I get to go to Mars. But it also means if I don't get to go to Mars, well, I've avoided that sort of problem here on Earth too. So what's the harm in doing something like that? So my mindset towards some of that, how do I stay focused on the long term, is to think about what the positive outcomes can be and setting up for myself protocols to ensure it's a heck of a lot easier to do. Because when we can automate something or when we habituate something, um, habituation is doing something with such a regular practice that you don't even notice it anymore. So when we can put some of our new behaviours into those sorts of categories, then it just becomes something as part of how you live. And now I don't pay half of the attention I do to half of the practices that are getting me Mars ready, but it's taken time to put it all together. 
So that covers how I stay motivated um, to a degree. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't be here for hours even just talking about that one. I was asked another question that I wanted to explore because it's this is a challenging one. Whew, I don't know how to say this, but why am I not embarrassed? <laughs> The question stems from um, the fact that I've decided to pin this big audacious goal to the wall for the world to know that I have signed up to go to Mars. And what if I don't get through selection? What if I'm not chosen? What if others decide I'm not good enough or whatever? What if I fail? What if I fail at this huge goal that the world knows I'm doing? Wouldn't I be embarrassed? Well, no, because I've had a go. Um, and what's, as my mother says, what's the worst that could happen? The worst that can happen is I could stay here on earth and live a really interesting life. And jeepers, imagine there I am at the end of my days, maybe many, many, many decades away, I'm, I'm, I'm on my, my deathbed and, and someone says, what are some of the most interesting things you've done in your life? It's like, oh, sit down for a while. Have I got a tale for you? So <laughs> am I embarrassed in making my life interesting and trying to do something so extraordinary? No, not really. And I've discovered over the years when I've applied for jobs that were what I might previously have thought of being out of my reach, especially as a woman, right? I mean, how many women listening to this right now will think about times when they have decided not to apply for something or not to share a big goal or a big dream with people because they're worried about fear of failure, about what others would think. What about, what would happen if you told someone? What would happen if you shared that information with someone? You'd be surprised at how many people step up and go, let me see if I can help you with that. Now, I know someone you need to speak with. What I've found through being bold in sharing my dreams is that others try and make it happen. Who'd have thought, right? That the world, the universe, everything sort of tries to collaborate to make your dreams actually a reality at times. Sometimes they don't. Ops, you know, that's life. But other times they do. So give it a bit of a crack because why not? Is there still a book in it, Living the Mars Life? <laughs> yeah, there is actually. Adele, I've got so many books in my head about um, you know, getting Mars ready and I've been asked to, to write one particularly about how I've been increasing my bone mass because that's a huge thing that can make a huge difference in, in a lot of people's lives. Um, so I want to cover another question quickly uh, that goes past the uh, being embarrassed. And this is <laughs> how do I manage... How do I manage to achieve then? Because you're not always successful, right, in life. And, and I'm, I've failed miserably in so many things. Absolutely. And I think when I do fail, I'm, yeah, some days I'll go, oh, you know, and I might even have a few tears or go, oh, I get really annoyed when something doesn't go quite right. Then I have my rant and after a while I move on. Or the opposite, if something hasn't worked, I go, oh, and then I use that to fuel, all right, well, God, Damn it then, well, how am I going to achieve that if that didn't work that way at this time? Doesn't mean it can't work another way. So I don't just give up and throw my hands in the air. I do have a bit of frustration sometimes. Um, but how do I make things work for me? Uh, and we've heard the saying, put the cart before the horse. And don't do that because, you know, the horse has got to pull the cart. I kind of challenge that a little bit. I sometimes put the cart before the horse. I put myself in the position of already doing the thing, even though I've got no clue how to do it. Because my belief is that, well, the horse has got the chance to catch up. A cart's ne never gonna be able to catch up with a horse unless it's attached, right? So put the cart before the horse, because the horse will get there if it's trained to do so. And that's the way the horse operates. It's always gonna get in front of the cart if it's been trained that way. So I train my mindset to go, all right, that's what, I'll, that's, that's what I'm already doing. I'm already living on Mars. I've already got unbreakable bones. I'm already a PhD in food waste. I, no matter what it is, I'm already that thing. So, all right, let's risk minimum How do I make sure I get there? How can I minimize the chance of not succeeding? 
as opposed to how on earth will I succeed? And so that's kind of my approach there, putting the cart before the horse and letting the horse catch up. Anyway, so we're just finishing up on time here. Um, just give a few minutes for people if you've got any extra questions you want to ask or some that I might have missed during our discussion. Um, so I can cover that before I sign off for day three of Science Week. And thank you so much to those who've been following this all the way through. I really appreciate you joining me for Science Week. A uh, bit of fun. Um, actually, Adele, good question for you. Living the Mars life, what sort of things would you love me to cover in a book like that? Because there might be some good topics I cover even on Instagram TV, like in these sorts of sessions, maybe a bit more often. Thanks, Lynn. I appreciate that. That's really cool. Um, just in the last few seconds, I'll let people type a few things. And, uh, I think it's here. Yeah, my mindset's been one of the biggest changes in my personal training. And it, it takes being open to doing it. And it takes, I think, what a phrase that uh, is a Zen philosophy called emptying the cup. And emptying the cup means to remove things from that space. So in Zen philosophy, emptying the cup, there's no room for fresh tea if the cup's already full. So when it comes to some of the challenges I, I put myself through to get Mars ready, I first of all take out the way I've approached things in the past. I cannot assume that what I've done before is going to get me beyond what I'm capable of today. I need to push beyond what's called the Kármán line. And the Kármán line is that it's where space starts so it's about 80 to 100 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And, and that's where, at that point, the air is so thin that humans can no longer breathe the way that they can on here on Earth or even you know, in the atmosphere. Uh, we need to have assisted breathing. Even flight, we can't, we can't have normal planes anymore beyond that distance. We have to go to space flight. So to get past our Kármán line, that place where Earth ends and space begins. We have to think differently. We have to use different technology. So it's kind of the approach I take with things. I empty the cup first to allow space for new opportunity to come in. So thanks again, guys. And look, um, body, mind, soul, that's some of the stuff that I think, Adele, that uh, I think is worth covering in a book. Um, so I'll, I'll explore some of those things. Thanks again, guys. Have a great day today and uh, see some of you for Science Week Day 4 tomorrow. See you later. Ciao.